said, we're going to repeat the time for your questions for them or for us as well. So first, uh, right here on my left, is Richard Negron. Richard uh, started in 1992 as the director of our very first uh, community school, IS218, in New York City. And that's actually the school that you saw in the video. So he was our first community school director there. Um, and then Richard went on to serve as the uh, director of the Children's Aid Society National Technical Research Center. Um, and then he became direct, director of community schools for Children's Aid Society. So Richard oversaw during that time a major expansion of our community schools uh, from Washington Heights and Harlem into the Bronx, into the, the South Bronx of New York City. Um, so to Richard's left is Vitalia Cortez Torres. And Medallia has been the community school director of the Children's Aid Society for the Southern Mayorena de Enrique Campus in Washington Heights. It was actually in New York City since July 2006. Um, and in that capacity, as you heard and saw in the video, um, she oversees all of the Children's Aid Society programs and services and all of the partner programs, working closely with the principals in the building um, and with the staff to ensure that coordination and integration. To her left is Lydia Aguardanda, who you saw in the video, you recognize Lydia? Lydia uh, was then and still is uh, the parent coordinator, uh, parent and community coordinator at SU campus, and she has held that position since 1993. Lydia actually began at the school as a parent and volunteer. She has two uh, children who attended the school herself, and she's been leading the parent engagement and involvement programs there uh, for many years, and knows the school extremely well. And to her left is Evan Noga. Um, Mr. Noga is a grandparent of a student at the school who's actually sitting to his left. Um, that's his granddaughter, Valerie. And uh, Mr. Noga and his wife, Irma, who's also here, and I'm not there, Irma, okay? Um, they, uh, again, they are grandparents and then guardians to, uh, to Valerie. And um, they have been very involved in the school, both in terms of, uh, you know, initially involved in workshops and classes, then they became active on the parent council at the school, and they've also been involved in advocacy work. Uh, just this year, they went to Albany and they advocated in Albany, both for community schools and for funding for after school programs. So um, they're going to tell me more about that on the panel. And last but not least is Valerie Rodriguez Murga. She's an eighth grade student at the school at Albany Arena um, at City College Academy School for the Arts. She loves dancing and she also attends the Children's Day Society um, after school program, the after school in action program. Okay, so please a warm welcome for our panel. Um, so I think we're going to start as I've already explained the role. We're going to jump right into Megdalia for the first question. Um, if Megdalia, I'd like you to just explain to folks a little bit more about um, your role, particularly with regard to the relationship between yourself and the principal. Um, how you make that work, um, what are some of those key ingredients to really making that relationship strong and successful so that the community school can be strong and successful? Good morning, everyone. Thank you for having us here at Philly. Um, one of the most important things that we start off with in the partnership is joint planning. Every year during the summer, we down the partners, I have three partners actually, because we, we are in a campus, we have three schools. So I sit with each principal during the summer to join plan around the rest of the year, specifically around how we can support each other to develop enrichment, academic enrichment programs and initiatives that will help the children become more successful during that year. Then what we do during the year is that we assess those programs and those initiatives and to see if the resources are enough and to support the efforts that we're making. We also, during the year, start to look, continue to look for resources and continue to build up on the work that we do as partners. Um, there are informal ways in which we meet and also very formal ways in which we meet on a monthly and weekly basis. Some of the forums that we use are school leadership teams that we're part of. We're also part of the safety uh, committees, the building council committees, and any leadership ability or opportunity that there is when it comes to the practice itself. Thank you. You said all that. 
Okay. Sorry? You don't work there all day. Yes, I'm working with them. And uh, Lucas may have mentioned, but in, in our children's aid society model of community schools, and what we found best is when there's a full time uh, community school director who, in our case, is a children's aid society employee. Um, and so, again, the Dali is there full time because, this is, as you can understand, this is a big amount of work to make sure it's all run smoothly, that the partnership is nurtured. Um, and so, it's a full time position that my next question is for Richard. So as I mentioned, Richard is an online and Richard has worked in many community schools and, and you know, oversee uh, the community school strategy. And so my question for Richard is, um, we know that the relationship between the principal and the director looks different in different schools because every school has its own sort of environment and climate. What would you say, however, are the critical ingredients in any community school um, for making that relationship between the lead agency you know, the partnership and the principal and the school successful. You know, what are the key ingredients to making that partnership work? Well, first of all, good morning, everyone. Um, what a lovely school. Um, uh, it was a great way for uh, to begin that my day walking into such a lovely, bright uh, school, which sends such a strong message. I think about. How we, how we care for kids, right? Um, so I'm gonna try and be um, very concise, which I sometimes have a problem. I've been known to be known with it, uh, but I won't. Um, I think there's several critical ingredients for success. Um, you know, I think the first thing that's worth mentioning and it's critically important is that this is an adaptation. Um, so this is really, a strategy about you know the needs that are specific to a neighborhood and to a community. So I think that in of itself I think is a positive, right? That it's not a cookie cutter approach. It's really based on a partnership. It's really based on engaging multiple people, stakeholders, meaning students, parents, teachers. You know, community residents, community-based organizations in a conversation. So I think when you look at it from, when it's working from that perspective, you have a much better chance of being inclusive um, and people feeling like they have a voice and a role. Critical to success that I've seen, not only in the schools that I used to oversee, but in my work as a technical assistance provider, is a long-term commitment. If you're going to do this, this community school cannot be a project. It has to be a long-term commitment, and you have to be prepared to do whatever it takes to make it work, to make the partnership work. Uh, thirdly is a vision, right? It's, it's having a clear set of uh, and a clear understanding of what are those programs and activities and services that are going to be necessary to help kids, families, and, and communities thrive, right? Um, results, a result orientation and a, a, a shared responsibility for results. It's critically important to, to demonstrate that things are working. It's critically important to look at data and use it to make joint decisions. And it's critically important that everyone that's involved in the effort is taking responsibility for it and holding themselves accountable for the greater good, which is about helping kids succeed, helping schools get better at what they do, and helping them um, the fifth point I want to quickly make is adaptability um, and flexibility, right? There, there are so many changes that occur, and so when a community school is thriving and succeeding, the partnership has the ability to adapt, to be flexible, not only to take advantage of new opportunities, but also to kind of anticipate and organize around fending off challenges. And the final point that, I'll, that I will make, um, and I have to admit, uh, our colleague uh, earlier this morning that made the presentation touched upon it, and it was one of 
my most pressing challenges is this notion of coordination and integration of services. Because if you don't have that, then what you have are a random set of programs that are not talking to, them, to one another, they're not effectively tracking kids, mm -hmm. they're taking kids from one another, mm -hmm. right? So a coordinated effort that's aligned based on ongoing communication, looking at data, making changes, uh, make process, make God say, is critically, critically important to effectively serve the kids and avoid redundancy and maximizing our precious resources. Thank you, Richard. Um, so our next question is for Lydia. So um, I'd like Lydia to tell us a little bit about, you know, we know that the parent engagement component and parent involvement is critical as well to community schools. It's really an, another ingredient that's at the heart of making community schools work. Lydia, can you tell us a little bit about both how you make the community school a welcoming place for families, and also once families feel welcome and are really you know, comfortable and part of the school community, how do you go deeper um, and really help families take an active role in your children's education um, and welcome to doing that in the school? Or some meeting, 
or waiting for a cup of coffee, and that's a very good moment for me to be talking to them about business. What is the business of the charity? Of course, to have a children when we leave. I, I am an example myself. I went on to the end, two of my children went to the school, and both of them are already away from my house, which I feel happy because <laughs> I said, I, I, I want you to leave my house, but as in the way that all the cats want, that they can make good choices, they can make money, they can live, uh, have a better life than the life maybe that I, that I could give it. They believe me, before and they open it, when they were about to open community school, they say on TV and I swear, it's going to be a school in this community, which is the community, my community, Dominican community. They're going to be open from 7 o'clock to 9 o'clock, and I said they got it clean. Because I was scared myself to walk in the community after it was dark. No, but my children couldn't go outside either. And now, after 20 years, you saw the picture maybe 10 years ago, you saw me doing flowers. There was like a candy that I was giving at that morning. The candy is over. <laughs> Let's go to college. Let's go to Star Eagles, let's go to Cali, let's go to, we go together, and I'm proving to you that you can do it because I did. So let's go together and let's walk and give me your fear in that way I share with you what we can do. But something that I do from the very beginning, <laughs> and that was in the, in the conversation, is that from day one, I'm ready to go after the wake up, and I saw so many resources for my people, people that, my friend lost their own children. I said, well, this is like a paradise and we can save it. We make sure that that place, nobody touch it. And we fight any time we need to fight in order to get our resources over there. So it's this every year from the very beginning, we go to Albany, Washington, uh, in the city. But this year I was very happy because they gave me 20 space to bring 20 people to Labi Day in Oman in February. And these two people, I mean, this gentleman and their wife, when uh, he's part of uh, the group, and for three years they been coming with me because it's not a matter of me taking them, I say to them, to come to Oman. But you should make line in order to make sure that what we have will never lose it. We change our community. I'm very happy and very proud. And when Lydia brought, as she said, the um, the great fact that she brought Mr. Morgan is going to speak a little bit as well about his work in Albany. So um, my first question for him, however, is just tell us a little bit about as a grandparent and a parent activist in the community school. Um, what do you like best about having your grandchild in a community school as opposed to a regular school? And Richard is going to uh, is going to be doing translation for Mr. Morgan, so I'm going to. Uh, Buenos días a todos. Eh, yo tengo tres nietas en la escuela comunitaria, en la cual yo me siento, cuando yo la tengo ahí, como que estuviera en mi casa. La razón es porque tenemos buen personal. Eso es lo principal. Además, tenemos una clínica que en cualquier momento, si ellos se golpean o que, que pase cualquier cosa, ahí están los de emergencia. Porque si ellos llaman una ambulancia, el costo, el tiempo y todo eso. Además, les ponen todas sus vacunas todos los años. Además, tenemos un, un concilio de Chile 6 a la cual que mi esposa y yo pertenecemos. Nosotros hacemos actividades en la, en la yarda de, de la escuela. <risa> He began by saying that he has three granddaughters at the Salome Urena campus. And, you know, he feels every day when he drops them off at school, he's at ease because he knows that they're going to be safe um, and looked after. Uh, why? Well, one reason is he emphasized the race that. He also emphasized the fact that there is a full school-based clinic at the school so that their medical needs are always taken care of. Um, as, a, as a 
grandparent that has grandchildren in the school, he's an active participant in a, a uh, parent council, a uh, parent guardian council that him along with his wife participates in. Bueno, queremos actividades, programas de escuela y escuela. Eh, en, la, en la clínica, que también eh, yo voy y les pido un papel para, para por lo menos eh, a, eh, ir a la escuela y después de, de, de la school program. Eh, bueno, yo creo que soy aprender de eso. Muchas gracias. He ended by saying that another feature of the school that, um, is, that he enjoys is that they have a, an after-school program that his granddaughters are participants in. He also, again, mentioned the importance of the clinic because in the clinic, they're able to get their physicals um, so that they can become members of the after-school program. Um, our last question is for Valerie, uh, Mr. Murray's granddaughter. And our question for you is just, again, as a student at community school, tell us what you like best about your school. Um, good one. What I like best about my school is that it's a community school, and there are a lot of opportunities like after school program that other managed Jackson companies, and there are job opportunities for people who are not. Also, they have a clinic where they, where they take care of you when you are sick, and you don't have to worry, you don't have to worry about, about not missing the school day because the clinic is a part of the school. Also, when my grandparents are working or in an appointment, I feel safe going to the family room or going to the teacher that I know or, yeah, that I know because I feel safe and Trust that they will treat you like they're all fine. Thank you. Um, so our last question before turning it over to you for questions uh, is for Richard. Um, so we know that one issue we see here in, in Philadelphia is that you're contending with here are the school closures. Um, and then, you know, there were issues with like utilization and so forth. So how does the community school strategy address this issue? I know you touched a little bit on this earlier, but if you could just elaborate on that a little bit. Well, I get the... Uh You know, it, it, clearly it, it, it's, it is complex and it, it's a difficult situation. Um, you know, we, we, we face a variation of it in New York City um, where many schools uh, are being closed because of not so much underutilization, but because of school performance um, has measured by the New York City Department of Education. And I think you know, those of us that follow these issues also know that Chicago recently closed a, a significant number of schools. So you know, these are real issues that are impacting and I think um, are, are worrisome, you know, has a strategy for so-called reforming, education reform, let's close schools. Um, so it's difficult and it's complex, but I think what we all can agree upon is that we need strong schools and strong neighborhoods. We need them both. Um, that those are critically important. And I think that it's, it's, it's evident to me from, again, just being in the school and, 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 and hearing different comments that, you know, schools cannot and should not be isolated. Schools very much need to be part of their neighborhoods and their community. Um, and it's clear that, that schools cannot do the things that kids need to be successful alone. And that they need partnerships, they need stakeholders, and they need a, a commitment that goes beyond sort of this traditional thinking of what schools can do. Times have changed. Now we're just going to turn it over to you for questions.
Hi, Vanessa Miller, South Philadelphia. Public school student, great school. Everything you showed on that film I had when I was in school. Everything. And then I didn't have it. I, my question to you is this. Would you agree that schools and community could be strengthened by an increase in minimum wage? The question was, do you think schools could be strengthened by an increase in minimum wage? That is the support of the financial support for families. Well, I, again, I, um, I, I think that that's part of the point that I was attempting to make, that you know, there's, a, there's a larger strategy that needs to be in place, right? That it's not, and that when you're thinking about strengthening schools, providing access for kids to get to college and complete college is issues like this that also need to be addressed, right? Um, and that's why I think that the community school strategy can provide a pathway for how, you know, for me, that the, my favorite definition of community schools is organizing resources um, in the school and the community uh, to strengthen student and community. So I, I think that these all, all these issues are interrelated and need to be addressed and calls for an expanded role that can be supported by such an initiative like community schools. Um, if you don't mind, there's a request to translate the question and the answer in Spanish. Oh, and then I guess there's a follow-up. You want me to translate the Yeah, there was, there was a request to translate the question, and I guess maybe it's done with the answer. Um, la, la pregunta que hizo la compañera es que si nosotros tenemos que, que aumentar eh, lo que se le paga ahora a los trabajadores es algo esencial. Y mi respuesta es que yo creo que sí, que parte de la estrategia de las escuelas comunitarias no es, es organizar los recursos de toda una comunidad. Y si nosotros fortalecemos eh, y, y, y buscamos la manera de, de, de fortalecer programas que, por ejemplo, bregan con la pobreza, eso es importante para fortalecer las escuelas públicas. Tenemos que hacer todo eso. I know there was a clarification, but we'll just go to the next question. Hi, uh, buenos días. Eh, mi nombre es Berta, soy de la ciudad de Puerto Rico. My name is Berta, I'm from the Puerto Rican community. And I have a topic of public education uh, in Puerto Rico. Uh, I study medicine and I'm a psychiatrist, all from public education. Uh, but before I went to study medicine, I taught for six months biology in a public school, in actually in high school where I studied in Ponce. Uh, my question comment really is, um, this is a charter school, community school. It's really a charter school. My big concern is that charter school are an effort to destroy public school. And, and also, And MetLife is an insurance, as far as I know, right? And even if MetLife gone or not, or data, I don't know, but it belongs to banks and insurances and finances that go out, which is the cause that public education has the funds. So I, I, I really, that is my big concern. The model is excellent. And I think to Cuba, and, and regardless of you, you know, being good or bad or socialism, that is a model that Cuba has in public education, without insurance, without banks, but with the resources of people. And I think that public education is really what we need. We don't need charter schools. We need a community that you say, What, what we say is like, don't pay the banks. The banks have to pay for public education, for health care. Thank you. Thank you.
charter school and a community school, so maybe we can provide some clarification. And then I think she asked the question on where do the resources come from? Yeah, the, um, by definition, in a community school, what we have just described is not a charter school. Um, although, in the spirit of you know being completely transparent, in the Children's Aid Society portfolio of school partnerships, we are partnering with a charter school because in, in that in that instance, you know, we view it as another opportunity. But but again, by definition, if you are interested in pursuing a community school strategy, it doesn't mean that you are converting or looking to turn the school into a charter school. It, it, one doesn't necessarily go with the other. I just wanted to add that, because if you, you know, again, you can read more of the book and so forth, and we're happy to work with you, talk with you, but the vast majority of community schools around the country, of which there are many, many states all across the country are traditional public schools. There are a handful, a very small, I would say probably like 1% of those, um, are charter schools. And, uh, and the model itself, you know, is really about partnerships between schools and community. You know, again, it's, it's, as Richard said, it's not a replication model, it's an adaptation model. So, you know, we are schools, we have 16 community schools in New York City, 15 of them are traditional public schools, one which we opened in September, as Richard said, is a charter school model. Um, but again, we're not, you know, we, we want folks to take the model, um, make it their own, you know, use it to fit their communities, and so, you know, that's, it's really a model to fit the particular community in need. Um, but you should know that the vast majority of community schools nationwide are traditional public schools. Um, and to, you, uh, I was going to say, before we go on to the resource question, can you quickly translate the question and the answer? Give me question and answer. I'm going to need more work. <laughs> um, actually, um, our colleague um, both made some, I think, stimulating and important comments. Um, I'm supposed to be saying this in Spanish. Nuestra compañera, ella no tan solo habló acerca de, de, de su preocupación de que el modelo, el modelo de las escuelas comunitarias es un modelo de, de charter schools que para lo que, que, lo que no saben lo que es un charter school, charter schools son escuelas que utilizan fondos públicos eh, eh, pero son independientes Y, y la realidad es que hay mucha controversia acerca del modelo de charter school. La compañera también cuestionó el modelo, el, 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 el por qué eh, lo importante de, de, de conseguir recursos para las comunidades, particularmente en aquellas comunidades que no tienen muchos recursos. Um, again, not word for word, but I hope I did you just speak of my other what do you put us like all of us and um, we do have to go to the breakout sessions and so we'll answer the, the question on resources where do they come from in the large audience but the breakout sessions at 1045 are actually with the panelists and the children's aid society experts so in those smaller group sessions you can ask the question you want is going to be in this larger form. Um, so after we answer the question on where do the resources come from, then I will um, go over the room. Um, we're going to separate people into um, educators, school staff, parent, and community, and then students. So we can go more in depth with this information. So the question was where do the resources come from? Um, the, the, when I'm going to give a little bit of history. When the initiative first began almost 20 years ago, the Children's Aid Society used private support from a number of foundations to get the initiative going. Uh, over the course of the years, the goal has been to find that balance between 
leveraging private dollars um, and, and to, to find public resources. So uh, the last year, for example, the budgets for the multi-site initiative were made up of private dollars from foundations. And, and, and I would say um, about 20% of that, uh, roughly, were from private dollars, foundations, and the rest were made up of public monies from the federal, state, and city level. So 21st century community learning centers were dollars that we were able to access that is available um, across the country. And then we access local uh, city and state uh, monies. We also partner with, with our school partners so that a portion of their budgets are redirected to be used, or redeployed rather, to be used on behalf of community schools. So for example, in New York City, their schools have money for extended day, that's part of after school. And if their focus is on remediation, you know, test preparation, um, then our after school dollars are used for enrichment, recreation, and the arts. The critical thing is aligning that. For our clinics, we access Medicaid, Medicaid reimbursement. So, you know, over the years, we've developed a, um, uh, a process for raising money, but I will end by saying that when you talk about sustainability, it's you know it's resources, it's keeping it too and growing, and, and and sustainability is much more than just raising money. Yes, this is true. And just to say one last thing about that to the resources question, you know, community school strategy is also about really looking at your particular neighborhood around the school. We at the National Center for, for Community Schools, we work with initiatives, you know, neighborhoods all across the country that are starting to work. And one of the first things you do is have you know, work with them and folks in that community to do resource mapping. In any community, there are you know there are untapped uh, programs, services, you know, mom and pop, uh, you know, faith based. There are all sorts of resources within the community, and many times those are not linked to schools. Schools don't show up if they're there. And folks in you know, so part of this is about helping you make those connections. There are resources uh, in every community. They may just not be the things that you immediately come to mind or that you're knowledgeable about, but they're there. So that's the power of community schools as well, in making those linkages and connections so that communities and schools together are working on this strategy for, for the betterment of kids and communities. Okay, so um, we look forward to working with you in the breakout community to put on the breakout and continue to uh, dialogue with you. So thank you very much. Uh, Um, so this